And now today, in just a few moments, we get to have the privilege of having uh, Pastor Jeff Valentine join us and teach to us. Um, we, uh, we are spoiled to have Pastor Jeff not just teach today, uh, but to have involved in the authority structure of our church. Um, Pastor Jeff and Mary Lee have faithfully served the Lord and served this community and served the church um, for some time. Uh, I, I'll let you tell years, but I know my entire life in ministry here in Missoula, I've been able to look up uh, to the Valentines and their ministry and their faithfulness to the Lord. And uh, it's incredible how God has used them to be just consistently showing the love and grace of Jesus to, to Missoula and to the churches. Uh, there's been a transition in the last several years that the Pastor Jeff has transitioned out of lead pastoring a church and now is in a full-time counseling ministry. I want to tell you that uh, it, it's incredible what he is providing in a less... Um, public eye of what he's providing to, to our community. I'll tell you that uh, I think our entire staff has gone to Jeff for counseling. Like he, he's the counselor that, that I need, that we need, and has spoken into all of our lives. Um, it is where we send so many people that uh, are, are needing more counseling than we are equipped to give. We send them to Pastor Jeff. Uh, Jeff also, um, not just into to my life and into this church, but there's a, a monthly gathering of pastors where it's not just uh, let's get together and talk, but where we need some, some counsel, not just in how to run church, but the emotional weight that some pastors carry and, and the elements that we walk through that uh, Jeff monthly meets with the pastors of this community to, to give us counseling uh, free of charge. And it's incredible. Uh, he is a behind-the-scenes he, behind hero and saint, uh, definitely to my life, to this church, but also the church of Missoula. It's just incredible, the faithfulness that they are demonstrating, and it is such a privilege to have him uh, as a voice into this church, and such a privilege to have him here today. Jeff, so grateful for you, excited to hear you preach. Would you come on up, and while Jeff joins us, would you stand to your feet, and would you thank and honor and welcome Pastor Jeff? Thank you. So great to you. Thank you, man. Wow, that is uh, very generous of you. Thank you for that warm welcome and those kind words, Kyle. I count it a privilege to uh, fill the small role that I do uh, with this church. And I want to say that uh, my wife and I are very, have a very big heart for a church plant. Uh, our ministry began with planting a church up in Canada. And uh, I remember those early days. We were looking for a facility to meet, meet in. There were not very many options. We ended up meeting in the YMCA, in the gym. And uh, for child care, the children were all crawling around on the men's locker room floor. Not, not ideal, and we, uh, we started looking real quickly into some options to, uh, where we could meet otherwise. But uh, um, I want to commend you uh, because, I don't know if you're aware or not, but only one out of four church plants actually makes it. That's a, a real stat. And so it's, uh, it's a real... Uh, testimony to God's glory that you are here today and that you're thriving. And it is to God's glory, but I want to commend your lead pastor and your, and your team here because uh, these types of churches that we're sitting in right now don't happen without a lot of work, a lot of prayer, and without the good people around us that uh, make it happen. And so congratulations on a year uh, of being a church family, and I, I just feel so blessed to, to be a part of this together with you. When, when Kyle first reached out to me and, and asked if I would, would speak, his question was, what would you like to say to a, a young church plant? And it came to me rather quickly, honestly. Um, yeah, I see the word hope in your vision statement. And I want to bring a message of hope today for a young church. And so we're going to look together at Psalm 22. And if you have a, a Bible and would like to look at that together with me, uh, it's a longer psalm. And I'm actually going to read the entire psalm. It moves right along. Uh, but uh, 
we're going to look together at this psalm. And as I read it, I wonder what event reminds you uh, or do you see taking place in this psalm? There's an event, and we all are, I would imagine, somewhat familiar with it. And so I'd like you to think about that as I, I read from Psalm 22, which is for the director of music to the tune of the doe of the morning, a psalm of David. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from, from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within the, my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the, the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. 
This is the word of God. Psalm 22. Now, as you listen to uh, what is going on in this psalm, I wonder, is there, is there any doubt about what it's referring to? The psalm is mirroring Jesus' experience of death by resurrection. Verse 6 speaks of Jesus' rejection by the people. Verse 7 and 8 speak of the insults hurled at him. Verses 14 and 15 are about the excruciating pain on the cross. Verse 16 is about the piercing of his hands and feet. Verse 18 is about the dividing of his clothes by lot. And that is just a few of the parallels to Jesus' death in Psalm 22. And yet, you may not know that the psalm was written 1,044 years before Jesus even showed up on the scene. That's how long the people of Israel carried this psalm around with them before Jesus was born. And just for a point of reference, that is four times as old as the United States. And so if that's the case, how are we supposed to think about this psalm? Well, one of the keys to understanding it is the title at the top of it. It's for the director of music, a psalm of David, and it was to the tune of the doe of the morning. And so I thought we would have uh, Spencer come up and sing it for us this morning. Uh, The problem with that is there were no audio files that came with the original manuscripts. And so over time, we've lost what the dough of the morning even sounds like. But believe me, back in the day, they all knew what that tune was. In fact, let's do this for just a minute. I will uh, say just a few words to a song that I believe you know. And then we will see if uh, you can finish the phrase that I state because you're familiar with the tune, I hope. So finish this phrase. I'm proud to be an American. All right. Lee Greenwood sang that song over 30 years ago. Some of you remember that. Others of you are like, who in the world is Lee Greenwood? Here's another one that's much older. It's a small world. Right. It's a small, small world. Uh, That was written over 50 years ago. I I stood in line so many times with my girls at Disneyland where they played that over and over (laughs) and over. I kind of have a PTSD type of response now. (laughs) I begin to twitch a little bit. But here's one more, and it's the oldest one. Oh, say can you see the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. Francis Scott Key wrote that 200 years ago. And all you needed to fill in the blank was a few of the words. The point is that these songs have been around for a long time, and we know the words. They evoke images and they spark memories and all kinds of themes start coming back to us. Psalm 22 was written to the tune of the doe of the morning. The people knew the tune and they knew which words to fill in the blanks with. It was just part of their culture. They sang the lyrics which were a comfort to them in their own suffering. It's a song sung 1,000 years before Jesus was even born. Now, in what way was it helpful to them? Because, I mean, it seems so brutal and, and negative and even graphic. Who sings songs like this? Well, that's, uh, let's, let's take a look for just a moment at the outline of the psalm. Here's what the people knew. It's a song that had three stanzas to it, if you will. Three segments that are roughly ten verses each. 
And the first section could be titled, The Silence and Seeming Absence of God, verses 1 through 11. David, the psalmist, is going through something, and probably the people as well, where he painfully asks, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. So you see, the song that they all knew begins with a sense that God is, is not there. And if he is there, he must not be listening. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Have you been through something where you decided, if God is real, he must not be listening? That's the first stanza of the song. The second segment is the next 10 verses, which might be titled, The Vicious Attacks of the Enemy, verses 12 through 21. And you want to say, really? Did people really sing this song? And the answer is yes, they did. And at this point, the psalmist is distraught about how brutal the enemy is. I mean, he considers the enemy to be like vicious animals that tear apart their prey. He laments how weak he is in the face of his enemy and how fearful he has become knowing what will happen to him. In verse 21, David says, Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. It's a desperate situation. And it's a last faint cry for help. Again, maybe you can identify with that on some level. You do not sense God's presence. And yet the enemy has its way with you in your, in your life. Those are the first two stanzas. The third and final stanza might be titled, The Promise of Praise for the Future. Verses 22 through 31. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my brothers. The last segment of this song contains no less than a dozen uses of the word will. It's what the psalmist believes will happen and what he will do. Verse 22, in the congregation, I will praise you. Verse 24, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. This is what they would sing as a community in times of trouble and suffering. They knew the song. They knew the order of the themes of the song. They could fill in all the blanks. It would eventually turn to praise and they knew it. Verse 25, before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. Verse 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Verse 29, all the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. It's full of hope. We're, we're going through this, and it's tough. But the Lord will prevail. We are his children, and he will triumph. All the earth will acknowledge him. Now, 
I want you to look at those headings on the screen. If we could put those up, all three of them. And I want you to note the direction that they are moving in. They start with a sense of God's absence, and they move in the direction of hope. Praise is coming. The future is going to be good. The psalm moves in the direction of hope. And so to bring this into our own world, something that will help you as you approach a new week, something you can carry with you in your own challenges, I want to make just two observations. Number one, David begins with his own honest perspective. The first verse of Psalm 22 goes like this, and it's David speaking. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Now think with me. Has God deserted David? Is God far from David? The answer is no. But it is the way David feels. And I admire that even though he feels God has abandoned him, still he speaks those feelings to God as though God is right there. Why have you forsaken me? I believe that there's something here for us. Isn't it the truth that when we're going through very difficult things as individuals, when it comes to the church, when it comes to the Christian community, for some reason we want to put the best face on it. Maybe we want people to believe that we're managing well. And so someone asks how we are doing, and we come off like, you know, it's all good. God's good. I'll be fine. You know, I know I can do that. People have been asking me during this past year how I'm doing. In 2020, I had two brain surgeries and the complications that went with those. And everything in me when I'm asked this year how I'm doing, everything in me wants to give a good report. I'm inclined to say, yeah, you know, brain surgery is no fun, but I'm going to be fine. But the truth is that while I have healed quite nicely this past year, I'm often concerned. I'm often nervous. What's going to be next? When is the other shoe going to drop? I'm sometimes fearful. And so often I begin with the other end of the psalm. I start with hope. And I'll say, it's going to be good. I'm fine. But I appreciate David here because he begins with how he actually feels. He feels as though God has abandoned him. And he gives his honest perspective in God's presence. And it's completely honest. And I think to myself, it's okay to be honest with God. You know, one author I was reading said, it's never, ever, ever okay to be angry with God. But when you are, you must be honest. Because he knows. And that's instructive to me. It's okay to be honest with God and honest in the community of believers. Yes, things move in the direction of hope in Psalm 22, but Psalm 22 begins with honesty. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Honesty in God's presence. That's the first observation. Second, Jesus quotes only the first verse from the cross. When Jesus is on the cross, there is only one line from Psalm 22 that he quotes, and it's the very first verse. We see it in Matthew 27, 46. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know, for most of my life, I have been puzzled by Jesus' question here. Does he not know the answer to his own question? Well, sure he knows the answer. He, he knows that he's paying the price for a fallen world and the sacrifice of himself. He knows that. But he's also being honest. He feels forsaken. But I wonder if there isn't something else going on here as well. He's quoting the first line of a song. A psalm that he, they know very well. And in hearing it, the tune would come to mind. They would fill in the blank. They would finish the song. And I believe that's precisely what Jesus intended to do. For those who heard what Jesus' final words were when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? the people who heard that would have known the direction that that song goes in. I believe that is precisely what Jesus intended to do. He's as honest as he can be. But as importantly, he's beginning a song. Jesus is signaling that there's a reason for hope. Israel, this song that you've been singing for over a thousand years, you know the direction that song heads in. It moves in the direction of hope. Hang on to that hope. Jesus is signaling that there's a reason for hope even as he's hanging from a cross and death is a moment away. One of the big takeaways for me from Psalm 22 is this. God is always doing more than it seems. God is always doing more than it seems. It would seem that death has had the final word, but God is doing more than it seems. And also, another takeaway, Jesus continually signals reasons for hope in our lives. He did that with his disciples. He told them that vicious men would take his life, that he would be buried, but he would be raised on the third day. He told them that in advance. And you know, as a, as a young church, in the future you will face challenges that to you seem impossible. I want you to remember, God is always doing more than it seems. For example, as there is more and more pressure on this facility as you continue to grow, you will gradually long for a place of your own. Maybe that's happening already, I don't know. And you will face what seems like insurmountable costs. And you may even hear yourself ask the question, how will we ever have a place of our own? But you see, God is always signaling reasons for hope. His word says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. His resources are unending. And his word says what is impossible for people is possible with God. And inasmuch as God is signaling reasons for hope, the truth is that we can speak his words of hope to one another. What song could you begin as you face various challenges in one another's lives? How could you encourage each other to remember that God is always doing more than it seems? That there are real reasons for hope. I have a, just a few verses of Scripture that I'd love to have you finish for me, similar to what we did earlier in stating the phrases of a song. 
Let's do this one. The Lord is my shepherd. You know how to fill in that blank. There's no situation where you will not have the resources that you need because God is your shepherd. Here's another one. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. There is no situation that you can face as a church where you can't have confidence that God is going to work it for his purposes. That's not something to say as a platitude when there's grieving. That's something to count on as a church body. Here's another one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, when we are confessing our sins to one another, when we are carrying a burden of guilt because of our sins, what song can we begin with one another? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. We do not need to carry that guilt anymore. God is always doing more than it seems. Jesus continually signals reasons for hope. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up as we conclude. As they're coming, I'd like to pray for you as a church body. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it's easy for us in some respects to be hopeful when, when we're surrounded by praise and when we're surrounded by people who believe. And it's just so exciting to be a part of this church this past year and think about the future. And Father, as challenges come, as we know they will, in the coming years. God, would we be able to remember this psalm and others, that you are always doing more than it seems, and that Jesus is always signaling reasons for hope. I pray for this congregation. I pray for this church family. Put a hedge of protection about us, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around this staff team. Protect them. Those things which would um, cause them to fall. Lord, might we remember that you are always doing more than it seems. As we approach discouragement at times, may this young church realize there's every reason for hope. In Jesus' name. Amen.